In this video, we're going to discuss distance and accumulated change. We know everything about the derivative function, what it is, what its graph looks like, how to find very important points related to the graph of that function. Remember, the de derivative was related to rate of change. And so a lot of times when we're given a function, we can go through processes, look at graphs of that function, look at tables of values of that function, and get the actual derivative or the rate of change of that function. However, what we're going to start doing now is we're going to start with the derivative. And with the derivative, we're going to learn about what information we can gain about the function, given that we know the derivative. And one of the things that allows us to do that is to review what we know about distance and rate of change and see how that distance or accumulate, uh, how we can use that rate of change to get the amount of change that has occurred. All right. And so this section is called distance and accumulated change. It is very important. It's very conceptual with some technical notation. So please pay uh, careful attention. Um, recall that the formula that computes the distance traveled at a constant rate over a specified uh, time period is, this is what we call uniform motion in math. And basically um, in science, you probably remember that distance equals rate times time, right? So if you're going a constant rate over a specified period of time, then you can multiply that rate by that time and you will be able to calculate your distance. It's almost as if you're driving on the interstate going 70 miles per hour. You want to go uh, 500 miles. Well, you divide um, your, your, you multiply the rate you're going by the five hours and you can see how close you can get to a, a, however the distance it is, right? Or you can put that 500 mile in for distance, you know you're going 70 miles, and you can estimate how, how long it's gonna take you by dividing both sides of this equation by the rate. That's normally how we do it. Or when I'm driving, I'm, I, I say, oh, I'm going 70 miles per hour, um, and I multiply that 70 by one, I know I'll be at set mile marker so-and-so, right? Because I'll go that number of miles. All right, either way, we use this all of, all of the time. But we're going to use this to kind of guide us into our next um, phase of calculus, which is getting into accum accumulated change. All right, so the goal moving forward will be to do a similar calculation, but to deal with situations where the rate is not constant, but it changes, right? So the rate of change, you're not going to constant speed the whole time. You're not going 70 miles per hour that entire time on the interstate. Sometimes you may go 75 or 73 or 78 or 79. And we want to be able to capture that and, and calculate derivatives in that um, scenario, right? And so let's look at this simple example to help us get started. It says a person walks at three miles per hour for 15 minutes, then at four miles per hour for the next 15 minutes, runs at five miles per hour for 15 minutes, and then cools down by walking at two miles per hour for 15 minutes. The graph below depicts this situation. How far did it go, all right? Um, well, we know distance equals rate times time, right? And so we have some, some uh, constancy in the rate that they're traveling, right? Because they're, well, that they're walking or running is because they're doing it in 15 minute increments, right? So what I'm gonna do to calculate this is I'm gonna divide my, uh, my time into 15 minutes. So I'm gonna have the first 15 minutes. I'm gonna have some stuff about my second 15 minutes. All right, my third 15 minutes. And then my fourth 15 minutes. minutes. All right. And so for each of these, I can calculate a distance equals I can do my distance equals rate times time. And that's going to give me the total amount of time, the total distance that they travel in that 15 minutes. Right. So in this first 15 minutes, I know that distance equals rate times time. And I know that they went three miles per hour that first 15 minutes. So I'm going to put a three in for R and then they did it for 15 minutes. So I will put 15 up. This is miles per hour and this is minutes. Right. We need to convert. Um, anytime you multiply things with units, you need to convert to make sure that your units align. Now, if I multiply the three times the 15, I'm not going to get miles, right? What I'm going to get do is I'm going to get, all right, if that's miles per hour and I multiply that by minutes, my units, if I multiply three by 15, is going to be miles per hour times minutes, all right, which doesn't make sense for us. 
And so what we usually like to do is to either convert the hours to minutes or the minutes to hours. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the 15 minutes to hours. We know, and I'm going to come off to the side here, that 15, one, uh, one hour equals 60 minutes, right? So that means um, if I want to convert that 15 minutes to hours, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by one. The way I'm going to multiply by one is by multiplying by one hour over 60 minutes. Since these two things are equal, when I divide them, they equal one. So I'm multiplying 15 minutes by one. And I put the hours on the top because I want my minutes to cancel. So since it's like in the numerator here, I put it in the denominator here. And so when I multiply across, I get 15 over 60 or one fourth. And that's my units is going to be hours, right? If you want to, you can change that to 0 0.25. And so during that first 15 minutes, they travel three miles per hour and they go for a quarter of an hour or 0.25 hours. And so we get 0.75 and my units here would be miles. Same thing happens for the second 15 minutes. When I do my rate times time, uh, we go four miles per hour times 15 minutes or 0.25 and I get one mile. Next 15 minutes, they state that she went five miles per hour. So I'm gonna have distance equals five times that 0.25, which is 2.25. That's actually a 1.25, sorry about that. And then I have distance equals rate times time here. For the last 15 minutes, they go two miles per hour for a quarter of an hour. That's 0 0.5. Right? And so if they go those distances in those separate 15 minutes, if I want to know the total distance that they traveled, I add the 0.75, the 1, the 1.25, and the 0.5. So the total distance will be the sum of these distances here, which is 0 0.75 plus the 1 plus 1.25 plus 0 0.5. And what we'll see here is that they have traveled 3.5 miles. I had to add that in my head. All right. And so this is a way that we can do it when people are going different speeds at different um, time intervals, right? Different rates at different time intervals. But the thing that I really, really want to uh, for you to understand is this graph here, because we're going to use be using a similar graph or the mathematics behind this graph is what we're going to use to help us solve a lot of problems here. So what we see here, this axis here is going to be our time, which is in hours, right? And then this one is our miles per hour, right? So if we start at zero, they went for 15 minutes, which is 0 0.25 hours. So that'd be a 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and then a one, right? Because they did, they walked for an hour or jog, walk and or jog for an hour. Now this calculation here was three times 0 0.25, right? This three is the height of this miles per hour, right? So on this axis here, I, I stated here we have the time, and on this axis we have miles per hour, which is the rate, right? And so the rate that they went was constant, which is why we have a horizontal line here at three miles per hour, and they did that for the first 15 minutes, which is 0 0.25. Well, this three, if you think about this, and this three is the height and then 0 0.25 is the width of this geometric shape, which is given here, which is a rectangle, right? So this distance here is 3. That's your height. And that 0 0.25 is your width. You multiply those two numbers together, you get the area of this rectangle. The same thing happens in the second 15 minutes. The height of the, the rate was four and it's constant. So that's why we have that horizontal line there. So that height is four and the width is 0 0.25, right? When you multiply a height and a width, you get the area of that shape. And so that one mile represents the area of that rectangle.
The same thing happens for our next few, our next couple things there. When we multiply, if we position our vertical axis to have the rate of change, um, and when we position our in input axis, our horizontal axis, to be the the change in some variable in the units that you're changing by. All right. And so what I'm going to start doing is, okay, we have a rate of change here, right? Our rate of change is miles per hour, right? So the thing that is changing is miles and it's changing per hour, right? The hours is like our input. The output is like our miles, right? So we have the rate of change of our output and our, on our vertical axis and on our horizontal axis, we have our change in our input. And when we multiply those together, we get the total change, all right? And so that total distance is basically your total change is going to be your rate of change in your output times your change in your input. All right, this is something that we're going to see over and over again, not only in this video, but future videos. If I multiply a rate of change in your output or your rate of change by the change in your input variable, then I'm always going to be getting the total change. And some people call this accumulated change. All right. Now, we use this distance equals rate times time scenario to help us get there. We're going to do that in one additional example. But what I want you to know here is that if I want to calculate the total or the accumulated change, I basically multiply the rate of change by the change in your input. All right. And then graphically, we can uh, get this as the area under your rate of change graph. Right. My rate of change graph is actually not these rectangles, but it's just these horizontal lines here because I'm traveling in the first uh, 15 minutes, three miles per hour, right? So my rate of change is just this here. This right here is for the next 15 minutes because it's four. It's five for the next 15 minutes and it's two for the next 15 minutes. So my rate of change is actually just those horizontal lines. However, when we try to get the accumulated change or the total distance traveled, it looks like areas of rectangles, which is why I have that graph right there. But the real graph would look, the real graph of this art, we have, all right, one, two, three, four, five. So the real graph would look like that, which is weird, I know, right? And so you have your rate of change on this axis, you have the units on which your rate is changing by on your um, horizontal axis when this is the case, the area under the curve, which is this part here, which makes a rectangle. And then this area right here will be that second. Uh-oh, join that a little sloppy here. This would be the third area and this would be the fourth area, all right? And so that total change equals rate of change times the change in your input, and this also equals the area under rate of change graph. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use rectangles to help us approximate that area, all right? Let's look at another example. A car comes to a stop six seconds after the driver applies the brakes. While the brakes are on, the velocities are recorded. Remember, your velocity is, your rate, is a rate of change. So in this chapter and moving forward, our content is usually going to start with us starting with a rate of change function. We're going to be starting with information about the rate of change, all right? And so what we have here in that top row is the time since the brakes have been applied, which is in seconds. And then the velocity is uh, in feet per second. That's a rate of change, see, feet per second. All right. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to give 
two estimates for the distance the car has traveled, all right? There are actually more than two estimates that we can give. I'm going to focus on two estimates in our course. The first estimate is to use, um, all right, so if I look at this here, we're going from zero to two seconds, then two to four seconds, and then four to six seconds, right? And they record the times at the zero second, the second second, the fourth second, and the sixth second, right? But we don't know how fast, you know, of course, as you're slowing down, you're going to be, let's see if I get this right, you're going to be going down gradually, right? Unlike that example that we just did where they, go, they went three miles per hour for a few minutes, then four miles per hour for a few minutes, then five miles per hour for a few minutes, right? Here, there's going to be more like a gradual um, decline there, right? And so sometimes uh, there are different methods. So for that reason, there are different methods to estimate these, um, the rates that represent each interval, right? Should I use the 88 or should I use the 45, right? Or should I use another number between 88 and 45 to represent the rectangle that is going to give me that distance when I take this area? Um, for those first two seconds, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to split this up zero to two seconds, two to four seconds, and then four to six seconds, right? And we know we have to do a distance equals rate times time for each of these. And so our total distance is going to be the rate that I'm going to use to represent my first two seconds the, since the car has been, uh, the brakes has been applied, and I'm going to mul multiply it by the change in my time, right? I didn't focus on this very much here, but each time we multiply by 0 0.25, right, because that was 15 minutes. That's the change between these x values here. For instance, whenever we say change, just regular change in math, it's just a difference. When we say rate of change, we have a, a, a ratio of differences, like dy dx or change in y over changing x, or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. In the numerator and denominator, those were changes, but we had a numerator and a denominator there, right? But this is a change in my x, because if I subtract this 0 0.25 here from 0, I'm going to get that 0.25, which we use here. Notice here, this is a 2 here. If I had a 0 0.5 and here, that's 0 0.25. If I subtract those two things, I'm going to get that 0 0.25 again, which I used here. From 0 0.5 to 0 0.75, again, that's 0 0.25. When I subtract those, then that's what I use here. And so that's why when in each of these, we multiply by the change in our input. And that's why we say change in input here. And so when we do this, we, we our t is the change in our input, right? But one way to do this is to go to zero to two seconds and always choose the left, the y value or the output or the rate that's associated with the leftmost point, right? So if I just look at the interval from zero to two, I have 0, 088 and 245. The value on the left is 88. The rate on the left is 88. So I'm going to use that rate, which is 88. And my change in my time, that well, that is going to be used for the first two seconds. So I multiply 88 by 2. I'm going to add to that the distance equals rate times time for the second two seconds, or from two to four seconds. Okay, now I'm going to focus on two and four seconds. I'm going to use the left. So that would be a 45, and my change in time is 2. And then for a four to six, I'm going to use the rate on the left, which is 16. So that would be a 16 times 2. When I put those things together, I'm going to get 298. And my units here, will, be, will if I multiply feet per second, that's what the 88 represents. Uh, two, two, this two right here comes from doing 0 minus 2, and they're both in seconds. And so when I multiply those, I'm just going to be left with feet. This is called, when I use the leftmost endpoint, a left-hand sum. And so another way that I can give this estimate is to use a right-hand sum. All right, that D shouldn't be there. 
And so in this time for zero to two seconds, instead of using the 88, I'm gonna use the 45. It's still a two second interval, all right? And so my change in my input is two. Now from two to four seconds, I use the right rate of change, which is 16. That's still a two second interval. And then on the right, I get zero. Now it may not make sense, but this is what we do, all right? You add those, you multiply and add those things together, you're gonna to get 100, and 22, again, my units is feet. And so since I use the right rate of change, it's gonna be a right hand sum, okay? A right hand sum. And so what I wanna do now is I want to sketch what I, those estimates that I just found in part A. I'm gonna sketch my left and basically my left and right, right hand sums that I found in part A. Well, with my left hand sum, notice here my on my horizontal axis I have seconds. On my vertical axis I have feet per second. Right. When I did my left hand sum, which I use 88 to represent that first two seconds. Right. So what I'm gonna have here for for is for seconds zero through two, which is here. I use a velocity of 88 feet per second. And so 80 is here, 88 is almost in the middle, but not quite. And I use that same value, and I'm trying to draw a straight line here, but I can't. And when I did that, I got that value there. All right, that horizontal line there, 88. Then I use 45 for the second two seconds. For So from two to four, I use 45, which is about here. And then for the last, I use 16, which is about here. Now, people really, really like to use, uh, draw the rectangles, not necessarily on that one, but for this here. And so we can definitely do that. And so the estimate, now this is going to get messy, which is why I'm using, I'm able to use different colors so it won't be as messy, but the estimate of that 100 and this 298 feet here is represented by the area of this rectangle plus the area of this rectangle plus the area of this rectangle right here. All right. Now, when it came to my right hand sum, all right, so from zero to two seconds, I use the 45 here. And so my right hand sum is going to have a height here, and that area is going to be represented by this area of this rectangle, right? Then I use 16 for the seconds two to four. And so I'm gonna get this area here. And then I use zero, which doesn't create a rectangle, that's no height at all, to represent that right there, which is no area here, right? And so, <clears throat> When we do this, we, we, we see that we can get very different numbers depending on all of this stuff, right? But the reason why we call this a left-hand sum is because we're using the values of our velocity that's on the left side of this interval, right? So we, we, we divide our sub-intervals into um, these two second intervals. Let's use a different color here. We divide it into these two second intervals here. And when you're left-hand sum, you're always going to use the leftmost point of your interval. And then your right-hand sum, you're always going to use the right-hand interval. And in the tables, you can really see left and right. And on your graph, you can also see left and right. But this always yields the area of these rectangles here. And so there we go. Part C here says, how can we obtain a better estimate of the dif distance traveled compared to the estimates found in part A? Well, one way to do that is to do the average, right? So this number here, since it's larger than this number here, it, we can also call this an overestimate. Now, there's some other information that guarantees that this will be an overestimate, but we're only going to look at things that kind of change like this. Notice I go from 88 to 45 to 16 to zero, 
And um, that means this is continuously decreasing. And so I know that this will in fact be an overestimate. And this is, a, since this number is smaller, this is an underestimate. All right, so the higher number is uh, overestimate, the lower number is an underestimate. And you can forget about that decreasing thing. It doesn't matter. Um, just know that the larger number is the overestimate, the smaller number is the underestimate. All right, and so to get a better estimate, we can do the average of the left and right hand sums. But left hand sum, I'm going to abbreviate that with LHS and right hand sum RHS. And so for me to do that, I can do the 298 plus. That was 122. You, when you take an average, you add up numbers and divide by the number of numbers you're adding, and you're going to get 210. And so we can obtain a better estimate by doing um, that right there. All right. And so <clears throat> to get an even better estimate, what we can do is we can uh, split that interval into more and more sub intervals, right? And so this is a picture here that will allow us to see how sometimes we have an overestimate. So if you look at this, this picture here, we have our time and our velocity, right? So this is almost like having the um, seconds here and the feet per second here. This is not a graph of that previous example, but here we have the rate of change function actually graphed, right? And so you can see that when we, we subdivide an interval into smaller and smaller subintervals, we're going to start picking up more of the actual area that's under our velocity curve, right? Usually our velocity curve is a continuous curve. All right. And so when we do a left hand sum or a right hand sum, we'll get an over or underestimate. For instance, if you look at this region right here, there's a rectangle. It's a very thin rectangle, which means we're using a lot of rectangles or a lot of sub intervals. Um, in this example here, we only have, well, from zero to two is one sub interval, from two to four is another, uh, the second one, and then from four to six is the third. That means we only have three rectangles. In this previous example, we only had four rectangles, right? In this example, there are a lot. And in fact, the more rectangles you use, the better your approximation is going to be, right? And so <clears throat> with that, you can see using this little bit, my left-hand sum, all right, if I could zoom in, can I zoom in? I cannot zoom in here. But my left-hand sum with this function here is actually going to be using Remember your left hand sum, if I have this, this is one endpoint, this is the other point. My left hand sum always uses the functional value on the left side of this interval, right? So this point right here is on the left. I go to the point where my curve intersects my point, and it's that point right there. And for that interval, I have this rectangle here, that small rectangle. rectangle. And it's going to be an underestimate because this rectangle doesn't include this little bit of area, this little bit of area that's under the curve. Let me do a, a larger view of that. So let's look here. Give me a few moments. So if I look at this, doing a left-hand sum, always, if you think graphically, you're going to come and you're going to, if this is my interval from here to here, right, the leftmost endpoint is here. You take the functional value of your rate of change curve, which is this value here, and you're going to use that as your height of your rectangle. Notice this height, this rectangle's area, which is this area that I'm shading in, is not including this area here, which I'm going to put in yellow. It's not including this area here. So this provides, this left-hand sum provides an underestimate. Now, I'm going to 
We look at a right hand sum. We're going to put it in blue. Well, on the right side of this interval is this point right here, this x value here, or input value here. When I go up to my functional value, I get this point right here. And when we do a right hand sum, we take that value as our height of our rectangle. Notice here that that value is encompassed. If I look at the area of that, it encompasses area that is above our curve right that's why it is in, is it is considered an overestimate all right and so your left hand sums now it's not always the case that the left is always going to be an underestimate and the right is going to be an overestimate you have to analyze the graph to know however if you get the values of your left and right hand sums the larger one is going to be your overestimate and the smaller one is going to be your underestimate unless they're equal and then then that's probably going to be the actual area. All right. So that's how um, this left and right hand sum is going to look graphically and why we can say words like over and underestimate. But what I wanted to show in this example of what you have in your notes is that the more rectangles you use, the better estimate you are going to have for your area. And so if I go back to the picture that we saw before, um, give me a couple of seconds here. copy and paste this back in. So for what we've, we've done before, the more rectangles you have, the less likely you are going to be to over and underestimate, right? So notice how this graph has more of an under and overestimate compared to this graph, this middle graph here, which has a lot more rectangles. And then our goal, just like with um, derivatives is to use that limiting process to make the width of those rectangles technically zero. So that the width of those rectangles, we're going to basically have an infinite number of rectangles that we're going to have, and then we can get the exact area under that curve. And that's going to give you the actual total distance. All right. This is a lot of conceptual things um, that go in the background or happen in the background of what we're going to be doing. But just know that your total change is your rate of change times your change in your input, which we have here. And it, we're going to calculate it using the area under a curve. And we're going to estimate those area under, a cur under curves by using rectangles. And those rectangles can give you an upper estimate or a lower estimate. All right. That's basically what we just did. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to find that this stuff um, works no matter whether we're in the context of distance equals rate times times or if we're in other contexts, right? And so we can use the same method to find the total change from the rate of change of other quantities, right? And so the way I like to say it is that your total change in your output, which is what we're interested in, is going to equal the rate of change of your output times the change in the input, right? Now, this is directly related to calculus, right? When we were writing the... Uh, rate of change. We talked about how that's the derivative. And when you write the derivative in Leibniz notation, we wrote that as dy dx, right? Well, I'm actually going to not write it this way. We said that this dy dx actually came from the stuff that we knew about slope. It came from delta y over delta x, right? Remember, we said delta y was your change in y over your change in x and how that was y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's a one. Right. And so instead of writing the subtraction, you can say delta y over delta x. All right. You guys remember that from algebra. We talked about it this semester as well. So this is our rate of change. Um, and we multiply that by our change in our input. Now here we we're thinking y equals f of x instead of f of p. If I use an x as my input variable, well, a change in something is always delta and then that thing. And so if my input value is x, that's delta x. And so I have d delta y over delta x times, that's supposed to be multiplication there, times that delta x there. And I like to use these asterisks so that they don't look like x's. When we multiply that, we end up with delta y, which is actually your change in your output, right? And so this is why this stuff works. Rate of change times your change in your input will give you the total change in your output, all right? 
And what we're going to do is we're going to use those rectangles, find, estimate the area under the curve, because that is what is going to give us the total change. All right, this video is getting really long, and so we're going to kind of stop at this notation and do one quick example, and then we'll do more examples as we get closer and closer to class. All right, so it says the symbol, this symbol here, is a capital S are your Greek letter sigma. All right, it's the sigma. It represents a summation. Some people call it a sum, or the statement itself is a summation. All right. You can think of it as a summation symbol. All right. Instead of writing out the estimates in the way in which we did in the previous example, we can write them using sigma notation. All right. So notice here, when we were doing these calculations, I did 45 times 2, um, 16 times 2, 0 times 2. In this example, I, had, I did 88 times 2, 45 times 2. 16 times 2. There's sort of a pattern here, and sigma notation allows us to uh, succinctly write that pattern. What we're going to eventually keep doing is doing this, but I do want you to know sigma notation, all right? And this is sigma not notation here. It says, suppose f of t is a function that is continuous um, on a closed interval. This is that closed interval stuff again. Then your right-hand sum is going to be written, and I'm going to read this this way. It's going to be the sum as I sum from I equals 1 to N of, and some people may write this this way, put this, these both in parentheses, F of, F of T sub I times delta T, all right? Your left-hand sum is the sum from I equals 0 to N minus 1 of F of T I times delta T. And basically what this does, this I right here, is also right here. And it's basically telling you to add up a bunch of expressions that look like this, but, but you're gonna add them differently by changing that i to be the next um, integer until you get to n. And so what this means is I'm gonna take this expression and I'm gonna first let i equals one. That means do replace that i with one. So I get f of t sub one times delta t. And then I'm going to add to that, because this is a sum or a summation here, I'm going to add to that when I change t, uh, the letter i to 2. So here, I'm going to write the same expression, but wherever I see an i, I'm going to replace it with a 2. And I can go and continue this with 3. And I can continue this until I get to n, whatever my, my last uh, whole number is, which is be n, all right? A similar thing happens for the left-hand sum, but this time we start at 0. It's going to be f of t sub 0 times delta t plus f of t sub 1 times delta t plus f of t sub 2 times delta t. And I put two plus signs there. I don't know why. Plus, and I'm going to continue until I get to f of t sub n minus 1 times delta t. All right. Now, what do these n's and delta t's represent? n is the number of subintervals. All right. It also represents the number of rectangles that we're going to use. All right. The number of subintervals and the number of rectangles. All right. Delta t is the width of your subintervals. And it can be found by doing B minus A, which is that closed interval, which will always be given you, divided by N. And as I said before, I is your index. And so this gives us a way to always calculate the left and right hand sums. Let's look at an example. It says, consider the function F of T equals 3 times T minus 5 squared, which represents the rate of change of some quantity. Estimate the total change from t equals 0 to t equals 4 using four rectangles by finding left-hand and right-hand sums, all right? So <clears throat> we're basically going to have to, all right, I'm going to come up here, create this stuff here or this chart but from scratch. And this is what the sigma notation helps us do, 
All right. We're basically going to create this chart, which gives us this stuff and this graph. But we're going to create it by hand from scratch without looking at a chart and without looking at um, a graph. All right. So keep the chart and the graph in mind as we do this. All right. My left hand sum, I want to bring that LHS. It's the sum from i equals zero to n minus one f of t sub i times delta t. All right. Now, what we need to do is we need to figure out what n is. n is your number of rectangles or your number of sub intervals. So it tells us that we're going to use four rectangles. That mean, means n equals four. And delta t is b minus a over n. That's the, your, this is your a, this is your b, and your n is four. So it's going to be a four minus zero over four, which equals one. And so my left-hand sum is going to be the sum from i equals zero to four minus one, which is three f of t i. Now, we already know our delta t is 1, so I'm going to go ahead and replace that with 1. So this means to do f t sub 0 times 1 plus f of t sub 2 times 1 plus f, uh-oh, I skipped 1, <laughs> went, went all the way to 2. f of t sub 0 times 1, f of t sub 1 times 1 plus f of t sub 2 times 1 plus f of t sub 3 times 1. Notice here I have 1, 2, 3, 4 terms. This is a functional value. So this is a y value. This is like a height of a rectangle times a width of a rectangle. A height of a rectangle times a width of a rectangle. A height of, of a rectangle times a width, right? So on and so forth. This f is a rate of change. f of t represents a rate of change of some quantity. Rate of change times the units are your change in your input, right? And so there we go, right? So we're going to have our four rectangles. We have to figure out what t sub 0, t sub 1, t sub 2, t sub 3 are so that we can plug them into our function, which we have here, and we get the actual height of our rectangle, and we can see that this delta t is our width of our rectangle, right? So the way we do this is we take this interval. My interval runs from 0 to 4, right? 0 to 4. And I'm going to use four rectangles, right? Remember I said 4 is the number of rectangles and it's also the number of subintervals, right? So I'm going to divide this into four equal subintervals. They're equal subintervals. So I'm going to draw three tick marks since I want to make four different spaces. And the width of those are one unit each. So from here to here is one unit, right? So if I start at zero, then this is a one. This is one unit, so one plus one is two. If I add one to that, I get to my next one. Add one to that, I get there. These are those t sub zeros. So this is t sub zero. This is t sub one. This is t sub two. This is t sub three. And this is t sub four. All right. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to replace, I'm going to rewrite this as f of zero times one plus f of one times one because t sub one is one. t sub two is two. So that's going to be plus f of two times one plus f of three times one. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have to plug these values into our function, right? Now, I'm going to show you how we can do this on our calculator. Right. And so with our calculator, we're going to use our y equals feature. I'm going to put my function in there is three parentheses. Now, I know it says t minus five, but we're on our calculator. We're plotting in the x, y plane. So it's going to be an x minus five. I press enter to lock in my calculator. I'm going to go to second window to get to my table set. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually plot. I right, get the value 0, 1, 2, 3. I want to plug those values in. I'm going to start with plugging in 0. Press Enter. Um, and the delta T is actually the exact same delta T that we have on our paper or on, in our notes, which is going to be a 1 here. And I press Enter. And instead of doing ask like we pre previously did, I'm going to go to auto or auto. 
And then I'm gonna go to second graph to get to my table and notice it gives me the Y values associated with these. So F of zero is 75, F of one is 48, F of two is 27, and F of three is 12. And so I'm gonna put those values, uh-oh. Now I've done mine. So that's gonna be a 75 times one plus a 48 times one plus 27 times one plus 12 times one. When you add those together, you're gonna to get 162. All right, so that was our left-hand sum. That's a lot of work, but it's kind of a simple process once you get the hang of it, but you gotta be able to fin uh, figure it out, right? Let's do our right-hand sum now. And so when we do our right-hand sum, the difference is instead of starting with I equals zero, we start with I equals one and go to N of F of T sub I times delta T. Now we know already that our N is four and we also already have I T, our T sub I's and our delta T is exactly the same. So the only thing we have to do differently is let this go from one to four. So we're gonna have F of one, F of T sub one times delta T, which is one, plus F of T sub two times one, plus F of T sub three times one, plus F of T sub four times one. <clears throat> T sub one is one, so that's gonna be F of one times one, plus F of two times one, T sub three is three, and T sub four is four. All right, if you go back to your calculator, you have those same exact values, right? But you're gonna use one, two, three, and four. And so my values here are gonna be 48 times one, plus 27 times one, plus 12 times one, plus three times one. You do the, that calculation and you're going to get 90. And so your left-hand sum was 162 and your right hand sum was 90. And so with that being said, we have our estimates, right? We could call our left hand sum, um, since it was greater, right? Yep, it was an overestimate. And our left hand sum, an underestimate. In order for us to get a better estimate, then what we can do is take the average of those two sums, right? And so that'll be a 162 plus 90 over two, which is 126. All right, so since this video is getting really, really long, we're gonna stop in this video here um, and we'll get to uh, this last example. In fact, I would like for you guys to finish your notes to do the last example. I'll tell you that your left-hand sum equals 142.5 and your right hand sum equals um, 106.5. And the only difference here is that your N changes. N now equals eight, which means your delta T is gonna change because that's a B minus A over N, which will be a four minus zero over eight, which is one half or 0 0.5. And so your values from zero to four, you're gonna break it down into eight sub intervals. So you have eight rectangles. So I'm gonna write seven tick marks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's gonna give you eight numbers. Their distance from each other is 0 0.5. So that's gonna be a zero. I'm gonna write these in as fractions because it's gonna be uh, too close together. So if I add a half to zero, I get a half. Add a half to that, I get two halves, which is one three halves, four halves, which is two, five halves, six halves, which is three, seven halves, and then eight halves. So this is your T sub zero, T sub one, T sub two, T sub three, T sub four, T sub five, T sub six, T sub seven, and T sub eight. And these are the values you're gonna use in your sigma notation when you do your left-hand sum. Remember, your left-hand sum, I'm gonna write it here, is the sum from i equals zero to n minus one, which is seven. 
f of t sub i times delta t. And your right hand sum is the sum from i equals one to eight to n, which is eight f of t sub i times delta t. Do these calculations and ensure that you get these values here. And then we'll pick up in class. Have a great day.